Welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting-edge topics and the latest industry developments. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased to welcome global entrepreneur, Emery Bishop. Emery Bishop is a serial entrepreneur with a deep background and passion for technology design, digital marketing, and problem solving. Along with his partners at Space Age, Emery looks to help build a future that is ever more productive and humane. Space Age is a digital innovation agency for high integrity, transformative brands looking to substantially drive positive change and growth. Space Age's mission is to explore and develop a better future through organizational design, social engineering, media works, science and technology, and strategic innovation. Emery and his team have made it their goal to help brand partners reach their full potential as a global force for good. Emery, it is a great pleasure to have you here with us today to hear more about customer-funded versus venture-funded startups. Thank you, and welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Thank you, Stelios. It's an honor to uh, be here. I really appreciate you, uh, you uh, uh, hosting me. Thank you. I'm uh, very excited to get started. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, share my screen, and then I'll introduce myself. I have a bit of a presentation uh, prepared for, for today, of course. OK, um, so. Uh, Customer funded versus venture funded startups. I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, this topic. It's a very, uh, I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, had a lot of conversations with entrepreneurs over, over the years that I've been a, a, a startup founder. And I think it's something that I keep revisiting. Um, there is sort of a, a number of paths that one can take. And I'd like to share with you my perspective on the differences between these two paths. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the title that I came up with for it um, is Giving VCs the Boot. But that, I, although that looks like a very controversial title, uh, you'll soon see that I actually am not disparaging VCs at all. Uh, I actually think that they're invaluable to the ecosystem. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of play on words because um, if you do this right as a, as a bootstrap founder, you actually will have VCs loving you just as much as if you uh, do it the traditional way. And we'll talk about the differences. So I'm just going to get right into it for you. So I'm just going to get myself out of the way here so we can kind of get into the good stuff. Uh, as uh, uh, Stelius mentioned, I am a global entrepreneur, uh, Canadian. I was German born. Um, and uh, I am currently a global traveler, so I do work uh, uh, all over the place at this point. Uh, my background is as a product designer and technologist. Over the last 20 plus years or so, I've had uh, several businesses that I've, I've been participating in starting. Uh, it's definitely been a healthy mix of um, failures, successes, and a few modest exits as well. About a quarter of the time that I've been in the game, I've been what we would consider venture-backed. And about three quarters of the time I've been in the game, I've been customer backed. Um, so I've definitely played with both sides of this equation. And I think it gives me a bit of a unique vantage point um, and just, just having the, the experience from that. Uh, currently, I'm actually an operating co-founder of several uh, projects. Um, my, my main gig is Space Age, which um, uh, Estelius was kind enough to introduce you to. Uh, I'm also uh, a co-founder of a number of other organizations that all fit together uh, into a larger puzzle that we're sort of working on um, as, a, as a group. Uh, that includes Status Society, uh, another influencer-based agency uh, based out of uh, South Africa and the UK, uh, Dark Horse Accelerator, a global uh, live streaming accelerator for bootstrap startups, uh, Haven Nutrition, a nutri superfood nutrition brand, Hacker Inc., uh, which is a venture builder building uh, innovative uh, quipple, triple bottom line products and services, and, and Gigas Technologies, which is a future of work platform that we're building to um, help support knowledge workers, uh, uh, spe specifically in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, um, get uh, awesome gigs, awesome contract uh, jobs um, in small teams. So that, these are some of the projects I'm currently working on. Um, I'm also an advisor with um, several startup uh, founders, um, and I love to support other uh, folks in the ecosystem uh, with their uh, missions. And uh, my personal mission in life is to positively impact 100 million human beings through my work. 
um, while supporting an ever uh, more productive and human uh, and humane global society. So that's, you know, that's a little bit about my background. The last thing I'll say is that um, I've been very interested over the last uh, number of years, especially thinking about what I'm going to call the quadruple bottom line. So I think we've heard of the, the triple bottom line. It's um, people, planet, and profits in equal measure. The quadruple bottom line is just adding purpose at the end of that. So it's it's people, planet, and profits in equal measure uh, with a purpose. Um, and I think that should um, hopefully replace uh, every business should basically become that. So that would be every, every business's bottom line in the future. And so I think that, uh, you know, right now it's still a novel idea, but, uh, as we move into the next decade, I, I do believe that there's an opportunity for all, all businesses to be, uh, positioned in that way where, um, the, the profit motive is just one of the, uh, ways that we measure companies. Uh, really quickly, a little bit about space age, um, just to, again, get that out of the way. And then we're, we're done with, uh, with the introduction of us, uh, this is my core, core gig. This is my main my, my main project. Um, you could say it's my full time gig uh, most days. Uh, it is a growth first digital experience agency. Um, we actually were introduced by uh, Stelios kindly uh, about what we do. Uh, a few details about us is that we're remote uh, first and we're globally distributed. Our team is um, in. Um, you know, a few different countries at this point. Um, it's a small team. We're only a two and a half year old company. And we, we founded the company in mid 2019 when I left a previous uh, company. Uh, and it's headquartered in Canada and the US. Uh, we have about 20 plus staff of marketers, designers and technologists currently, and uh, we are growing. So uh, we're very thankful for that. And um, we also see Space Age as a sort of a launch pad for several of our other projects for both clients, partners, and also our own ideas. So it's a, definitely a, a launch pad type company. Okay, so we've got all that out of the way. Now let's uh, let's put some uh, house rules in place for, for for this presentation. So first things first, um, I'm going to be unapologetically biased um, in this presentation. Um, I understand that there's multiple perspectives to uh, what is a good idea or a good path for you to build your startup. Um, and I think there's a very popular narrative that uh, we're all very familiar with. It's the one that we see in all the major media outlets, uh, you know, TechCrunch uh, celebrates uh, these companies. Um, a lot of a lot of um, great entrepreneurship uh, programs um, celebrate the, uh, the the one path that we're all very familiar with, which is the venture back path. Um, I am actually going to come and uh, provide a bit of a uh, discussion or argument for that being only just one option and not necessarily the best option for many of us. Uh, so my goal is to just provide you with a fresh minority perspective. When I say minority, uh, yes, I am a minority visibly, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually talking about my perspective on entrepreneurship. So that is, uh, that's what we're going to try to do here. And uh, there is more than one right way to build an extremely successful startup. I think we have a bit of a a narrative that says that the only type of business that gets built successfully is the business that has a lot of financial backing from venture capital uh, firms and angels and so on. And I actually think that there is, uh, well, we know for, for a fact that there's lots of uh, examples to the contrary. Uh, and I'm going to stress satisfied founders because that's a big, big piece of this equation that we have to be thinking about as well. Um, are you creating a successful company and how are we measuring success? And are you creating a successful founding team? And are, are, are you gonna be a, a, a satisfied founder um, at the end of the day? And that, that's, a big, that's a big question mark depending on what you do. Okay, so the first thing I'll say is that uh, whatever choice, and we're gonna get into the details of what the choices are for you um, between these two paths and, and how they sort of work, but regardless of which path you choose, uh, you choose, I want you to understand that there is uh, a lifestyle choice that you're making by choosing that path. Uh, it's not just a business decision that you're making. It's actually a lifestyle decision. So it actually, um, it's not like a normal job. So any folks who are sort of watching that this might be um, your first uh, rodeo. This is the first time you're thinking about getting into building a, a business. Uh, I think this is really important to understand. I think if you've ever had a job, uh, entrepreneurship is nothing like any other job you've had. Uh, it's a 24 seven job. Uh, you really have a hard time turning off uh, when you have people respond, especially if you have people responsible that you're responsible for um, and people's livelihoods that are at stake. 
and you've got customers that you're answering directly to or other stakeholders like investors, um, it's not easy for you to just to shut off at 5 p.m. and then take the weekend. And so you have to really understand that whatever type of business you create and how you decide to fund it will actually dictate in large part the entire experience of your life around this business that you're building. Um, and uh, so that's the first thing to think about. Uh, the second thing to think about is that a lot of us entrepreneurs say that we're unemployable. Um, but are you truly unemployable? And, and you really have to ask yourself this question because if you're truly unemployable, you actually also might be unfundable, okay? Because um, having an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur having a uh, an angel investment group or a venture capital group or any investor that is giving you money is now taking a position in your company where they actually have a lot of precedence. They have a lot of um, priorities in decision-making, a lot of priorities in the direction that the company is going to go. And it can feel sometimes like you actually are now employed. Um, uh, to the entrepreneur, uh, to the uh, sorry, the venture capital firm or the or the uh, the the venture uh, funded um, partners. So if that is the case, then if you're the type of person that's not really great with having other people making decisions, you know, for your business, uh, and you think, well, I'm the CEO, so or I'm the founder, I should have you know the top say here. Uh, you better think very carefully about raising money because um, you will actually have. You'll find very quickly, typically, that 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 you do actually answer to somebody, okay. Um, and the other thing to think about is, are you process oriented or are you outcome oriented? Okay. Again, this is again still lifestyle. So if you're process oriented, it means that you are basically really excited about the day to day process of entrepreneurship, and that is what really gives you your energy and your juice. Um, you could still be very future oriented, very visionary, but you're really trying to enjoy and trying to really be present in the process of building your business. Um, if you're outcome oriented and you're really obsessed just with the outcome, then it is actually a different lifestyle choice. And perhaps that is going to dictate which of these two paths you're going to want to go down. So that's a third question that you're going to want to ask yourself, you know, which, which, you know, what are you really uh, gunning here for? Is it the outcome that you're chasing within entrepreneurship or is it the actual process, the day-to-day -day process? Um, and then either way um, you decide it's arguably easier to get uh, gain wealth or attain wealth uh, doing many other things. Okay. So if you're getting into this sort of, uh, and again, here I'm speaking to somebody who's not done this before. If you're thinking about, you know, entrepreneurship and you're trying to choose between the path, uh, the, the two paths here, you may also, there might be a third path, which is actually not going down either because entrepreneurship is actually very, very difficult, regardless of which path you choose. Um, and um, there's other ways that you can actually make money if that's what your, your goal is. If that's your outcome goal is to make, you know, as much wealth as possible, then maybe entrepreneurship isn't necessarily the best idea. Um, so again, we're going to hopefully within this presentation, as you're going to walk away, where I'm going to help you make, uh, you know, at least have some of the information you'll need to make a decision on what your lifestyle is going to be over the next foreseeable future once you go down one of these paths. And then also, what is your work style going to be look, 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 looking like? Okay, so those are the two uh, areas that uh, hopefully uh, this is going to help you make a decision on. Okay, so um, I'm going to get into a lot of like conventional sort of ideas or memes um, as it relates to entrepreneurship. Uh, and I just want to dispel a few of them, but I'm going to have to bring them up before I can dispel them. So um, as founders, we've always been told that we are the prize, but should we actually believe that? So this is this game is a bit of a numbers game, depending on where you are um, in, in the ecosystem. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's it's a numbers game. But if you're a VC, it's also a numbers game. Uh, and uh, our numbers are different. You know, um, we typically as entrepreneurs have one business, um, the venture, the venture capitalists or the folks that are giving you money typically have multiple 
interests, okay? Um, and they are playing the numbers. And so you may be just one person, typically you are one person or one group that they're you know, looking at um, and investing in, in a given um, uh, period of time. And um, in, in your world, this is the only thing you're doing. This is your whole life. Um, and in fact, if you're raising money, you're definitely, well, you're likely not going to be in a situation where you can actually have multiple interests. Okay. Um, if you want to go that path, that's all that, that, that's oftentimes a bar to you because one of your fiduciary responsibilities, um, as a founder of a venture backed company is to be a full-time founder and with no distractions, because you're, again, you're, uh, there's other people's uh, money that's on the table now, not just yours, and they want to make sure that they have 100% of your focus and attention. So um, understanding that this is a numbers game is also understanding that you are not necessarily the prize because there's other prizes um, that folks are chasing. And if you're not meeting the expectations, then you may not be the prize. So uh, I know that it's it, it's often uh, what we're sold, but I, I want to sort of dispel that a little bit. Okay, so basically, in summary, what's best for VCs is often not best for founders. I'm going to explain uh, a little bit more into that. Um, that was a quote by uh, Minda Zetlin of Inc.com. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to break that down a little bit more for you. But I just want you to understand it again. Um, Alignment's really important. Incentives and alignment are the, the two things you got to really understand in entrepreneurship is like, you know, what is everybody's incentive at the table? And then what is the, uh, um, uh, basically like, what is the incentive and also what is the alignment between the groups? Is it everybody aligned on the same side or is there different, um, are people out of alignment? And if they are, uh, that can lead to a lot of difficulties. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, also unpack some terminology because I, I'm, I'm throwing out these words like bootstrap and customer funded. Um, I, I'm going to be bucketing some things here um, today so that it's easier for us to think about this stuff. Uh, so on the bootstrap side or the customer funded side, I'm going to be bucketing a number of different terminologies that I'm, I'm defining as a bootstrap company, a non-venture backed company. So if you're thinking of a company and you're calling it bootstraps, I'm talking about you. If you're thinking about a company called self-funded, called customer funded, called vendor funded with like, you know, net terms from a big buyer uh, or supplier, I should say. Uh, if you're thinking of crowdfunded even, um, if you're thinking about grant funded companies, if you're thinking about companies that basically um, are uh, debt or credit funded, um, and be careful of these ones, but they are definitely still bootstrapped. Um, um, and if you're also thinking of, um, you know, companies that are using factoring or debt financing, like essentially they're selling their accounts receivables. So a company that basically maybe is getting funding through a, a, an organization like ClearBank, I'm also talking about you. Okay. So these are anything basically where you're not giving equity for, um, you know, for money, we're talking about you. Okay. The terminology on the other side that I want to talk about is the venture capital bucket. So when I'm talking about venture capital, I'm not just talking about VCs, although they are a big, you know, piece of that that ecosystem. I'm talking about family backed. You know, if you take money from your family and it's in the form of like, you know, in, in exchange for equity. If you have basically friends that give you money, so friends and family money. If you have basically angel backed money. If you have money coming from venture capital firms, if you've got money coming from an accelerator that's exchanging it for, uh, for a percentage of equity, an incubator, again, exchanging for a percentage of equity, uh, basically any and all equity exchange for capital, I'm talking about you, okay? And basically, um, that includes things like more exotic sort of convertible equity where there's an option later on where that can turn into equity, things like convertible notes and safes, uh, which are convertible securities. I'm also talking about those as well. So just because, you know, you're taking a safe doesn't mean that um, this isn't a venture backed project, you know, um, because uh, more times than not, it's going to convert. Okay. So this, these are all the terms I'm, you know, lumping together in this bucket just to keep things simple. So again, uh, you know, if, if there is, money coming to your company in exchange for uh, equity and it's not it's not basically um, uh, sweat equity coming into your company in exchange for for a percentage of equity then then you're basically venture backed 
Okay. So um, let's talk about now, now that we have all the, you know, we got all the preamble the way we've got all like the language, we've got the sort of the caution. Um, I want to get into the two different paths. Cause I said that this is basically venture backed versus customer funded um, companies. So let's talk about these two different paths and how they kind of look. Okay. Well, the first thing um, we need to understand is actually there's kind of three different paths. So I'm going to actually break it down because I, I said two, but there's actually three. Okay. So here's path one. Path one is this is all going to be so cool and glamorous and easy. What path am I talking about? I'm kind of talking about the path that if anybody here has seen the social network, I think this is a, a movie that probably launched a lot of entrepreneurs careers after they watched this really cool movie. I, I actually love the movie, but it, I think paints a, a certain type of picture of like what entrepreneurship is supposed to be all about. And it seems pretty awesome. It seems pretty glamorous. Uh, who, who knows? Maybe you could build the next social network. Right. Um, so uh, you know, there's a famous quote in the, in the movie that uh, I love is, uh, you know, a million dollars isn't cool. You know, what's cool, a billion dollars, uh, you know, by Sean Parker, one of the, one of the characters. Um, so we're going to call path one, the, basically the Zuck avatar path. Okay. Uh, for, for Mark Zuckerberg, basically the persona of this path is raising a million dollars. Isn't cool. You know, what's cool raising a billion dollars, right? So this is the, the kind of person that just assumes that this is like, what basically entrepreneurship is all about, right? It's, you know, you just go and raise a bunch of money, you know, it's really easy. Uh, you know, I saw it in the social network, you know, Mark Zuckerberg ro rolled into a bunch of venture capital firms with like, uh, you know, in his pajamas and everybody was trying to throw money at him. You know, he ended up raising so much money and, you know, and the rest is history, right? So that's path one. Okay. So here's path two. This is, um, part of the same path, but this is what some of the rest of us maybe think. Okay. I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I guess I'll just go raise some money, you know? So it's like very common. It's like every buddy, even if you don't think that it's going to be as easy as it was in the social network, you still think, Hey, if I'm going to start a business, I need to go raise some money. Um, and that's, what I've been told, like everybody tells me that I was told that, and you know, maybe I took an entrepreneurship course in school. I've talked to some advisors. They told me that, uh, I've everything I read online, you know, I've, 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 I've you know, I've read entrepreneurship.com a lot. You know, I see all these other companies raising money. That's basically what I'm supposed to do. So that's the first thing I, I, I was taught how to pitch, right. I was taught how to pitch ideas. Well, what am I supposed to, if I'm pitching, who am I pitching to? Well, I'm pitching to um, people that have money. So th this is basically uh, another version of path one, but we're going to call it path two. This is basically, uh, <laughs> this is the, the Game of Thrones path, because this is more the harsh reality of what it actually looks like when you're raising money. Uh, <laughs> the, the quote, uh, Egret from Game of Thrones, if anybody's watched the show, you know nothing, Jon Snow. So uh, Jon Snow is the bastard of Winterfell. Uh, so reality is a bastard in this. Uh, it looks a lot more like this than it looks like this. Okay. Uh, even though that, you know, that, that does also look hard, but it also looks very beautiful. This is kind of like what raising money is going to look like for a lot of us. Okay. So, um, path to facts, basically only 0.05% of startups actually raise venture capital. Okay. So it's not a lot, right. Out of all of the companies that are getting started only not even 1%, not even 0.1%, 0.05% actually raise venture capital, even though if you listen to media, it would look like every company is raising money, right? Um, through venture capital. The average seed round is about $2.2 million. So if you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of money, it is a lot of money, but it's also a lot of responsibility. You don't get to put that into your personal bank account. That money is going into your company. You've got to spend it. You've got to spend it fast and you've got to spend it in a certain way. So uh, again, it, it will, it will feel sometimes like that money is not your money because it isn't. Uh, and, and nor should it be, it needs to be uh, managed um, for specific outcomes. Um, and you've got the stakeholders that are going to give you some direction on that. Right. Um, so um, it takes about an average of three to six months to uh, uh, full-time typically committed to raise money by one of the co-founders. Uh, that's another thing that a lot of people don't realize. They think, well, you know, I'm going to talk to three or four folks. 
you know, my mom and dad gave me money for this company. So now I'm just going to go talk to three or four more folks. It's going to be as easy as it was with my mom and dad, you know, and um, they go out into the real world and realize that oftentimes it's not that easy. Okay. Um, where you live actually matters and your background actually matters in this equation as well, whether you're, you're going to be successful at raising money or not. Uh, and again, there is, it's not impossible to raise venture capital. That's not what I'm trying to say here. It actually is very possible. Um, I was able to raise venture capital. I have many friends that were able to raise money. Um, I think that most of us that are in the startup ecosystem uh, know mo many, many entrepreneurs that have successfully raised money. So it is definitely um, possible and plausible. However, um, it is not easy oftentimes, and it is difficult to continue to raise money. That's the part where, you know, I think we sometimes get misled where we think, well, if I raise some money, that's enough, but no, that puts you on a path where you've got to raise more money because there's an exit strategy that your investors have that you need to meet. And you can't do that with a, with typically the first round that goes into that company. It's very, very rare that you can only raise one round. You typically have to raise, raise multiple rounds in order to get to the exit that everybody's envisioning. And so if that's the case, then, um, you know, um, each time you raise another round, less and less companies are successful. Okay. So, and if you're not successful, it doesn't mean that you get to sort of just switch to bootstrap mode. It means typically the business has to get shut, shut down. Um, there's lots of reasons why that's the case. Um, typically it's because of the way that the structure is built around the company. Um, the expectations of all of the people that are now employed by that company. And, and in terms of like, you know, what their expectations were getting into the business, uh, they're not going to easily just sort of say, well, you're not able to raise more money. So we're going to you know, um, manage our expectations. A lot of people that are coming into a venture capital backed company are also coming in for equity uh, and stocks. And if there's nobody giving enough money for it to continue to go towards that path that everybody has started on, typically nobody has the motivation to continue to work on that business. Okay. And you can't sort of just lower everybody's expectations in terms of like, we're not, we're not going to uh, try to get it to an exit anymore. We're going, or we are, but we're going to do it, you know, much slower uh, or much different than what we said initially when we invited everybody into this, um, this company. Uh, the other thing too, is that you just don't have the, um, the, 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 the burn rate of a business that's venture backed is typically way higher than a, 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 an equivalent bootstrap business. So you just have everything, your expenses are in such a, a place that, you just really can't unwind all that stuff. Um, and so it's actually much easier for you just to completely shut the business down um, or the business will just be forced to be shut down based on your, uh, the pressure from your, uh, your partners. So uh, this is, again, um, some of the real hard truths about the venture capital. Uh, here's a couple of like statistics around this stuff. Um, Again, it doesn't mean it's not possible, but you just want to know the data. You want to know the odds, right? So if you look at like in the US as an example, you've got basically 42, you know, as of 2019, when this, you know, study came out by uh, TechCrunch and they were referencing a number of other very credible um, uh, research publications. But basically uh, research was that 42.26% you know, of all of the money raised uh, over uh, this period of time uh, was uh, was uh, raised in Silicon Valley, right? Which is a very very small part of you know California in the U.S., right? It's not it's not a you know that's that's basically and sorry and this is this is sort of was um, uh, U.S. businesses, but also um, they were looking at like uh, you know um, money money going into those companies from international areas as well, right? Um, so you have basically nineteen percent going. Uh, coming from all the rest of the U.S., you've got uh, the second biggest market was in New York, um, which was uh, you know uh, outside of Silicon Valley, which was thirteen point you know and a half percent, and then Los Angeles was the third, and then you had money coming in from Asia as well. Okay, and then there's like a few other areas here that are on the left side that are much less significant, right? Um, and these are U.S.-based companies. Obviously, if you go to other parts of the world, you're going to have a little bit of a different story, but it's more or less the same story where there's different like sort of hubs in every major market that basically um, is where all the money is coming out of. And so if you're not in that area, it's a lot more difficult. Now, I know post 
you know, a pandemic or as we move hopefully uh, through uh, to the other side of, you know, uh, COVID-19 and what's what sort of happened with the world, you will see uh, that this is, is going to change because there's going to be a lot more um, virtual, you know, virtual meetings. And we're already seeing that there's a lot going to be a lot more folks investing in companies that are not outside of their regions because they're seeing that you know the world is is very hyper connected at this point but that still is it's still a very traditional space and so you will still have a, a very significant advantage if you are in a particular region um, that we're describing here so if you're in silicon valley you're going to have an advantage if you're in new york you're going to have an advantage um, maybe if you're in los angeles depending on what type of company as well you're going to have an advantage the contrary to that is that if you're not in these areas, which is 99.9% .9 of us, you are not going to have those advantages, right? And so you're going to have to basically understand that the chances of you raising money is even less than average, right? In those other places. The other thing is, is that, you know, again, not, not harping on this, but basically there is um, a... Uh, bias, not only in terms of what region you're in, but there's also a bias in terms of where your company uh, founders are coming from. So what's their background? Uh, education, education for venture back companies is a, is, a, is a very important piece to decision making for most uh, investors. And many uh, folks that are coming out of specific Ivy League universities are going to have an advantage. Um, and if you're not in those universities, again, you're going to have a disadvantage. So um, understanding that, you know, um, you might want to factor that into, you know, which path you're choosing. And finally, um, what you, you know, your ethnic background does play a factor, as we I'm sure know at this point by 2021, I think it's been pretty, you know, um, uh, recognized that there is a uneven sort of distribution of funding that goes to different types of groups. Um, and it doesn't mean it's impossible to raise money if you're not in the, um, you know, sort of the 77.1% group here, but it does mean that your chances are, you know, um, are, the odds are not necessarily always in your favor, right? So um, all of these things hopefully are changing, you know, and we are seeing things change, um, but, you know, we're, we have a long way to go. And so just understanding that, uh, there is more than one path. And again, as an entrepreneur, um, if you're doing entrepreneurship for the right reason, which I, I believe is to solve problems, then you don't need permission to do that, which means you also don't need permission from venture capital to do that. And we're going to get into um, these two paths and how that works. Okay, so basically, path three, this is the path that I'm obviously biased towards. Uh, if, if, if the title of my uh, <laughs> my uh, presentation didn't uh, didn't uh, indicate that. Um, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'll aim to solve a problem that people will pay us to solve for them. Okay, that's basically what I'm thinking now. I'm not thinking about raising money. I'm thinking about just trying to solve a problem and getting somebody to pay me to solve that problem for them. Okay, so that is the answer um, for many of us. Um, basically, here's the facts of path three. You can usually start with next to nothing, especially in 2021. Uh, it was much harder, uh, you know, uh, to do this 10 years ago it was even harder 20 years ago, of course, you know, further, the further uh, back you go, the harder this would have been to do for next to nothing because the cost of technology has created a, um, a huge advantage for folks of us who are building companies in 2021, because, um, uh, most companies are by their nature are technology centric, right? And the technology oftentimes is things you don't have to purchase. There's free technology, uh, you know, software. Uh, there is access to lots of uh, uh, subscription oriented, you know, tools and software that would normally cost you, you know, traditionally maybe thousands, if not, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to access. Now you're getting it for a fraction of that. Uh, there's open source. There's all sorts of ways that you get access to things that you need to build your company for very, very little amount of money. Um, um, and basically, if you think about it, uh, these are statistics to understand 77% of small businesses, which are startups, you know, when they, when they first get going, rely on their personal savings to, um, uh, to, uh, basically fund their company. Right. Um, and a third of small businesses start with less than $5,000. 
the average small business re requires 10,000 in startup capital. So that's again, not, not a lot in the grand scheme of things. Uh, you could do it for less, but that, you know, that as an average, that's not too bad. And then um, it's not 2.2 .2 million, um, like the, you know, the average venture back company. Um, and um, here's the thing. Um, as soon as you sort, sort of go down the bootstrap path, I think a lot of people believe that it means that the outcome is going to be pretty small as well, right? If you're only, if, if this one company is spending $2.2 .2 million to get going, and I'm only spending like less than $10,000 to get going, obviously my company is just like a fraction of the, it's going to be a fraction of the size at the end of the day. That's actually not true. Uh, it can seem like that's true. And it, 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 there's a possibility that that could be true. But if you start down the bootstrap path, you have all the same options um, later in later that a classic venture capital firm um, has. So if you want to raise money at any point, you can do that. It's not the same the other way around. If you don't, if you, if you go down the venture capital path from day one, you don't have the option to just stop raising money. Like re realistically, that's not going to be a very reasonable option for most of us who go down that path. Uh, that has not been my experience where when I went down that path, I would have loved to get off the train uh, based on my personal circumstances doing it. I wasn't an option. Okay. Um, and um uh, this is basically something that um, I think there is a misconception about. So I don't want to stress that, that starting as a bootstrap company gives you kind of all the upside, but it doesn't give you any of the downside um, that, that at any point in time, you could pull the trigger. Uh, now, I will say that there's a bit of a caveat here because uh, there's sort of a saying um, when, you know, when you're deciding when to raise money, you kind of have two options, right? You can raise money before you, you validate, which is basically what a venture capital backed company typically does, um, or you can raise money after you validate, but you can't raise money kind of in between. So if you start as a bootstrap company and you're not able to be successful as a bootstrap company, you're not going to be successful raising money with that business. So it, it isn't sort of a get it, it isn't an escape valve. It isn't a get of, you know, it's actually easier not to have any data and go out and raise money than it is to go out and raise money with data that's bad data. With, like meaning that if you have a company that you started, you know, on your own dime, and then you started taking it through a process of validation in the market, and all of a sudden you're, you know, 12 months in, you ran out of money, and now you're like, oh shoot, I better go raise some money. And customers still aren't excited, or maybe they're not excited enough, and you don't have um, enough, you know, sort of evidence that this is a good idea. It's actually going to be more difficult for you to raise now than if you had just actually took the business plan before you actually hit the market and then took the money first, right? So that is the caveat here: is that uh, if this is basically a force, this is a, I would say it's a reverse engineer. Um, it forces you to basically reverse, reverse engineer success and a certain successful outcome and have milestones that are clear um, so that you give yourself those options I'm talking about later on. Um, but what you can also do is you can never raise money and you can just continue to reinvest into innovation, into more expensive endeavors with the business and into scaling the business on your own dollar. And you can actually get other types of capital that's non, um, that we sort of talked about briefly at the beginning of the, of the presentation. You can go after that type of capital at any other stage, like things like factoring, you know, you can get that um, depending on what type of business you're building. Uh, you can also get um, debt, you know, there's debt uh, uh, funding. So there's other ways that you can put money into the company without actually exchanging equity for capital and putting, you know, venture capital into play. Um, so that's basically um, the facts for path three to think about. Okay. So um, let's talk about basically the stages now, because we've just talked about sort of like the different paths here. Let's sort of break them down a little bit so we can kind of define what they look like, how they look a little different now that we know like, okay, well, there's some differences to putting money in versus not putting money into the company. What are these, what do these companies look like in, in, in different stages? Because they look different. They, they, they do look very different. So the stages of venture back startup looks like this. Uh, and again, this is, really high level, really simplified, but uh, I think it kind of paints a pretty accurate picture for most of us who have gone through this process. You have the basically three different stages. You've got the pitch stage, you've got the sort of traction stage, and then you've got like the hyper growth or scale to exit stage, right? 
So let's talk about the pitch stage. So the pitch stage is basically where you're focusing on crafting a really compelling story or pitch to your financial backers uh, or future financial backers. Basically, the goal is to just convince somebody that you've got this awesome idea that if they get involved in, they're going to make a ton of money. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but that's essentially what you, all you have to do here, right? And, and when I say all you have to do, I'm being a little facetious because it actually is not that easy to do that. But if you are good at, if you're good at learning how to pitch and you, you know, sort of stack the deck in your favor in a couple of other ways, you can definitely go out and do that. Um, this is really about sort of building out at this stage, a minimal viable product. We've heard that term before, if we're, we're in entrepreneurship, if you're not, it's just really simply like the, mo the most minimal sort of version of the product that will actually get folk, uh, folks to uh, make a commitment whether it's to use the product or to purchase the product. So that's basically, you know, what you're kind of chasing with the, within the pitch uh, stage. Uh, then as you start to, you know, once you've been successful and you've got the, the first money in your seed round or your, you know, your early, early series round, you're basically now chasing traction. That's all your job is. You're, you're basically consumed with this idea of getting traction because you need to keep telling the story as you go through uh, further fundraising events, you know, so the first event being at the pitch stage, but now that's just the starting point. That's not like, you know, uh, when you stop raising money, that's just when you start raising money. So now every, uh, you know, typically whatever the term is, maybe it's like every, uh, uh, you know, 12 months, um, there's different, there's different numbers here, but basically let's just say every year you're back out on the road, raising another round. Maybe, maybe it's a year and a half, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's typically pretty quick, you know, every, every year, year to year and a half, you're back out raising more money for the company. And it could even be faster depending on how, you know, you sort of set up your, 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 your series, uh, raises. So, um, that's basically what is going to happen. Um, and remember I mentioned that it's three to six months. So it means that the founder is typically, uh, taking time off each year and a half to go raise money for three to six months. Typically. Now, again, there's exceptions to every rule. Uh, if you have a certain background, if you've already been successful pre prior with a, an exit, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, established relationships, if you come from, you know, all of the um, sort of advantageous backgrounds I mentioned earlier, then of course, you know, you can raise it faster. But we're talking about averages now. And so not all of us have all of those advantages or, you know, the, 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 pre, the prehistory. And most of the folks that are trying to raise money are doing it for the first time, right? There's a very small percentage of people that are doing it for the second or third or fourth time, uh, just by the nature of, you know, um, how life works. You know, there's always more of us that are getting into something than there are, um, I've already gone through it. So um, this stage is categorized um, and the traction stage is categorized by basically, um, you know, using the money that you, you've now been getting from your investors in these rounds to, you um, basically validate your concept with either users or customers. Now I'm going to stress that it's either users or customers because unlike bootstrap companies where you're forced and we'll get into that in a minute, but when you're forced to just focus on customers with a venture back company, oftentimes you can get away with just focusing on users. So as long as somebody's actually interested in your product, they actually don't have to pay you. Why? Because you're making your money from raising money. So as long as you can keep buying users and you have money coming in from, you know, people that believe in the exit and they believe that eventually once you win enough of the market, you can actually turn on monetization. As we like to say, you can kind of basically flip the switch and go from like free to paid or, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, examples that we can look at of that. Uh, and then, um, that is sort of the, mo the model, right? That's the model that the venture capital, uh, firm, in fact, it's almost like a crime if you, um, are, uh, uh, be trying to be too uh, conservative and, you know, chasing profitability um, when you could actually just spend more to get more market share, typically, if you're a venture backed firm, right? So if you if you basically are like, you know, kind of conservative in nature, and you're like, well, hey, I want to make sure that, you know, this is very profitable, every move we make, that's not the game that you're playing here. In this stage, especially what your goal is, is to basically try to get as much traction as possible, show evidence that people can basically continue to give you that money that you need to fuel additional rounds of growth. Okay. And then finally, uh, you get into hyper growth. This is the exit stage. This is basically the stage uh, um, 
where you're chasing the exit. Okay. So again, with these type of companies, you have a, uh, you know, spoken or unspoken agreement with every stakeholder that I am not trying to keep this company around forever in my ownership, owner, under my ownership necessarily, unless it can go public. What I'm looking to do is get it acquired by somebody who's bigger than us, who can basically now, you know, take it to the next level, right? And that's how most of your investors are banking on the fact that they're going to get paid out. They're not typically expecting you to go public. There's very few companies that do it constitutes less than 1% of all US firms. So, you know, most companies are not going public. Um, Many companies that are successful are basically getting acquired by, you know, either publicly traded companies or uh, high, you know, uh, high capital uh, private companies, right? So this is basically the the three stages of a venture backed company. And so your job is to take your company through all three of these stages as efficiently as possible, as successfully as possible. Your investors are expecting it. Your, your, um, typically your employees are expecting it. Your customers are oftentimes expecting it, right? So that is basically what you're signing up for. Um, again, nothing wrong with that, but that's just one option that you have. Okay. So now we understand what that option looks like. Um, also understand that there is a bit of a dark side to venture capital. And when I say VCs, again, it's not necessarily venture capital firms, but there is a dark side of venture capital. Okay. Um, and, and VCs are, you know, a big part of that, of course, um, there is this sort of push for hyper growth that can be a little unnatural and create bad decisions. And, and it throws, uh, the founder out of alignment with their, um, investors. Okay. So you might want to start a company for specific reasons. You might have a certain set of values, uh, around the company, around, you know, your ideas for things like sustainability, your ideas for things like quality and craftsmanship, your ideas for things like, um, employee satisfaction, uh, customer satisfaction. If there is, uh, you know, a situation that come arises within the company where, you know, it actually makes more financial sense to throw some of those values to the side, uh, temporarily even, you know, just to say, Hey, well, you know, we'll get back to that later. Let's just, you know, kind of make some decisions here so that we can get to the next round uh, and get the traction we need. That is going to be something that you're going to be very pressured to do. It's an experience that, um, you know, I've, I personally, you know, had, um, it's an experience that a lot of founders I've talked to have had. Uh, and so just understand that, that there is this pressure to grow at all costs. Okay. And when I say all costs, I stress that, you know, there is costs that you may want to pay that you, or there's costs that you may have to pay that you didn't want to pay. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, a win for a venture capital firm, isn't necessarily a win for you. What do I mean by that? So if, if a venture capital firm basically has a portfolio of companies and I'm saying venture capital firm, but again, it could be other types of investors. Um, we have the bucket, remember? Um, but let's just say that um, a, a win for a venture capital organization is that they need to make a return on their investment. Uh, typically, you know, they're chasing 10X or more on each investment that they make. Um, why is it 10X or more? Because uh, they know that not every company is going to be successful. Um, obviously, they want to get a lot more than 10x, and if they're lucky, they're going to get way more than 10x um, from you know a, sm- a small minority of the companies that they have in their portfolio. And then the rest of the companies are going to probably go to business, or they're going to be really small wins. Maybe they're like acquisition hires, where they're sort of like acquiring talent, things like that. So there's lots of different outcomes. Most of the companies are going to fail. A small percentage of them are going to succeed, but success is relative. They're going to succeed because they're not going to go to business, but they're not necessarily going to make a lot of a return for the, uh, the investor. Um, and so for them to win, they need their portfolio to win. They don't necessarily need you to win. And so they may actually make decisions for your particular piece of this pie, their portfolio pie, that actually is better for them because maybe, you know, pressuring sort of an aqua hire for them, meaning that basically try to sell your company for, you know, um, uh, parts, you know, for lack of better words, but basically sell, sell your company at a very, very you know, j- just to kind of cover their, 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 their costs and write it off. Uh, that may be actually a better decision for them than it is for them to try to, you know, fight with you to, um, uh, fight for you, you know, to, to basically stay in the market. Right. So they're making decisions based on a lot of data that isn't 
exactly, you know, aligned to your necessarily best interests or your company, even they're making decisions based on everything that they're, they're looking after, uh, with it, you know, within their portfolio, whereas you basically, um, a win for you is only if your company specifically wins in the way that you're hoping that it's going to win. Um, and then always remember that venture capital is never free. It feels sometimes in the beginning, if you're a new entrepreneur and you're going out for the first time and it feels great to pitch and somebody loves your idea and they're willing to cut you a check, it feels awesome. I remember the first time I, I uh, achieved that and I felt like on top of the world, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, you know, somebody's give me an idea or so give me money for an idea. Like this is such a good feeling, but it isn't free. And it can feel in the beginning, like it is, but for all the reasons I've already just outlined, it isn't free. That money comes with a price and the price is a responsibility to the investors. It's a price as, as sometimes trade-offs. Sometimes the trade-offs are acceptable to you. Sometimes they may not be at least uh, understand what the trade-offs are. And if you're not, get educated on what the trade-offs are going to be. Because if you go into venture capital with a really good understanding, um, and I actually have projects right now that I intend to raise money for, uh, you can actually go into um, venture capital with a very, very positive kind of experience and also a positive attitude towards it. And you can actually align with an investor's in, a, in an amazing way that actually makes them even happier than if you sort of raise the money too early, because now you've already validated it for them and they're excited about giving you that money that you need to take it to the next level. And you can, you can now pick the investors that you really want to work with for strategic reasons or otherwise um, that you wouldn't necessarily always be able to convince to work with you because um, uh, uh, prior to actually um, achieving some measure of success independently. Okay. So, uh, that's, you know, again, just the story of venture capital there, there is, um, you know, uh, some challenges with it, but it can also be a good thing if you do it the right way. Okay. Let's talk about the stages of bootstrapping. Okay. So this is the other side of the, the coin, um, the, the side of the coin I spend more of my time on. There's three phases as well. The three phases look a little different though. Um, the three phases start with a validation and pre-selling stage. Okay. It could be selling, but normally it's pre-selling. You're selling as quickly as you can. You want to sort of get, you want to understand what am I trying to build? Because you have so little money typically <laughs> on this, in, unless you're, you know, you had some really great exits prior or something. Uh, you basically, um, are, um, you know, not in a good position to, uh, to, not spend money very, very wisely. And so what you want to try to do is validate, uh, not in phase two, like you're doing with the venture firm, you want to validate in phase one, right? And so um, really, you, you know, you're, you're constantly selling your idea at this stage as quickly and as often as you can, right? Um, you don't want to wait, right? You don't want to be spending money and going, you know, what? like once I finish building this thing, I'm going to, uh, you know, figure out, uh, you know, how much we're going to sell it for everything. You want to actually get out there and go, is somebody going to buy this? If I start putting money into building this thing, is somebody going to buy it? So that's sort of, that's sort of the idea with the, uh, th this first phase. So, um, it normally starts out with your personal finances as we, as we sort of seen with the data. However, again, you don't have to have a lot to start it. And there is workarounds, you know, there's uh, things like crowdfunding uh, where you can basically pre-sell like significantly um, on an idea that, that you're sharing with the world that, um, and they're voting on it by giving you a little bit of money um, for uh, in exchange for, you know, early uh, product um, uh, access. Right. So that is, an awesome option that's really underutilized by most entrepreneurs. It's a, a misunderstood, uh, sort of, it's, it's used, but it's not used nearly as much as it should be considering how the merits of it. Um, and especially not in the tech entrepreneur world, um, where most of us live, it's more used in the maker world and the creator world, like the world of, um, you know, the artists and folks like that. So, uh, I think that there's, that will change over time, but I think that that's a, that's an amazing resource. Uh, and then there's also, um, just, you know, personal direct pre-sales. You can convince people if you have a really cool idea to give you a deposit on that idea and they can commission you to kind of build it for them. So there's lots of ways to do this. Basically, um, I like to think of this as instead of a minimum viable product um, that you're chasing, what you're doing at this stage is you're, you're chasing a minimum viable audience, okay? Because sales and marketing is so much more important um, because you need to sell before 
or as quickly as you can, um, um, definitely before you run out of money. Um, so you need to get uh, a, a hyper attention and focus to your audience and, and, and listening to them and understanding what they love and what they need so that you can build the right product. So you're not as obsessed with the product development. You're more obsessed with the audience development at this stage, right? Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to get into the next stage, which is basically the customer funded stage. This is basically where now customers are now paying you. It's similar to traction, but it's a little different. They're paying you for your product and um, you are basically... Uh, learning from your customers consistently, and you're uh, basically, you know, getting that product market fit. Um, and you're, but you're also working on operational integrity. You're working on making sure that the company is very profitable. Typically, uh, it's also you're you're focused on sustainable growth, not like hyper growth or speed. You know, trying to speed through the market. Um, there is circumstances where you may want to change the speed of things based on competition, things like that. So there obviously is some uh, decisions that always have to happen re regardless of what kind of company you're building here. But um, oftentimes you do have a lot more control over the growth curve because you don't have the pressure that you typically have with the venture capital side of things, right? So because you don't have that pressure, really the only pressure is going to come from, you know, your own a uh, smaller inner circle, which would be, you know, yourself and maybe your family um, and um, and your your co-founders and your, your team, and of course your customers, that's pretty much, you know, you're making all the decisions here. So if you want to, you know, have a bigger outcome or you want to grow faster, you can do that, but you don't have to. You're not getting that same pressure that you're going to get uh, when you go down the other path. The other piece here is that, uh, sorry, the, the last phase here is the capital investment stage. Okay, so the capital investment stage is basic, or uh, I apologize, the capital reinvestment stage. Um, the capital reinvestment stage is basically uh, essentially the the uh, the stage where you basically take money and start to fuel money from customers typically. But you know, again, there's other ways you can raise money for your company. Um, lots of ways we we've already talked about, right? Like the factoring, crowdfunding. You can even crowdfund later. You know, like you don't have to wait to you don't have to only crowdfund when a company or idea is new. You can crowdfund at any point in time. Uh, lots of companies do that. So you can basically take whatever capital from customers or from some of these other. Um, uh, mechanisms, and you can actually turn that into um, innovation. You can basically start to upgrade your products and services. You can start to hire new staff and scale out. You can go into new geographies. All the wonderful things that you would typically have to do with venture capital, you can actually do through being creative with getting capital in these other ways without giving up equity. Okay. And so um, for the capital and uh, bringing on uh, venture partners that way. So this is basically um, also the phase where you can optionally seek um, venture capital and get investors involved at this point, because now you've already proven everything out. And like we mentioned before, you now, have, because you've validated your business idea, you can now very comfortably um, and confidently talk to um, investors and and give them your terms. You know, tell them like these are the values of our company. This is what we're building. This is how we're building it. This is the you know exit that we're going after. Maybe we're not even exiting, um, and we're just going to continue to keep this company uh, independent and uh, thriving and growing uh, indefinitely. Right. And so these are um, options that you have, and because you're probably not going to be in a bad position if you've done this you know, successfully, you don't have to like, um, feel desperate about taking on the venture capital. Um, it just becomes an option for you. Right. So, um, these are the three phases of bootstrapping again, a little bit different, well, a lot different in my, from my perspective. Um, but, um, there is definitely, uh, like a similar life cycle in terms of each phase, you're sort of have a different set of options. Here's some helpful tips if you are going to go down this path. I think there's been like, you know, if you Google, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, there's lots of advice on how to be basically how to pitch, right? How to how to go raise your first round and all that fun stuff, right? Uh, there's not a lot of advice on bootstrapping. So I think we need to get more information out there for founders. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give some tips now. Uh, so one of the things uh, I would say is, um, uh, you know, basically soft launch your first product as quickly as possible. So you want to basically, like I mentioned, pre-sell the product. Uh, you want to um, 
uh, there's sort of an uh, old uh, saying, and I, I apologize, I forget exactly who said it first, but basically, if you're not embarrassed by your first product, uh, or you're sorry, by, by your first uh, version uh, of your product, then you've waited too long, right? So if you if you waited too long to launch, it's because you try to perfect something before you get into market. If you're bootstrapping, you do not, you do not want to do that. You want to get into the market very quickly and iterate and, and sort of validate it as quickly as you can. And it doesn't even have to be the finished product. You can, as we mentioned, you can pre-sell things, right? So that's basically, you know, where we want to soft launch quickly and often uh, when we're starting up to figure out exactly what we're building. Uh, you wanna become your own PR magnet. Uh, so public relations is something that when you're venture backed, you can afford to pay for. You can hire like a, a PR firm and get them to, you know, um, you know, basically pay to play. You can get them to basically go out and, you know, get you into uh, certain publications uh, for a specific cost and they can, you know, sort of manage that whole thing for you. If you're bootstrapped, you really don't have that luxury typically. Um, you want to actually do something so compelling that people are coming to you, that press wants to write about you. You uh, basically are attracting the story. Uh, you are the story. You're not going out and sort of fabricating and buying, you know, sort of attention. Okay, so that's the difference. Uh, so you definitely want to do that. Um, you also want to um, uh, basically be very resourceful. Um, again, you can't afford to hire necessarily everybody you want to hire in the beginning uh, if you're bootstrapped. Uh, you don't have um, as big, uh, typically, a checkbook in the beginning. So you want to basically do it yourself as much as possible. But you also want to know when to ask experts, just like you would as a venture capital firm. One of the big merits of venture capital uh, sorry, if you're a venture uh, funded company, not venture capital firm, but uh, if you're a venture funded uh, company, uh, one of the big advantages that, you know, you'll be sold typically, uh, which is true, I think, uh, for many uh, companies is that you actually get surrounded by a very healthy network of experts, right? Um, it, it's to everybody's best interest that you have like really high quality advisors and, um, you know, experts that are going to help you with all the areas that you are not going to be, you know, um, amazing at as a, as a, as a early stage founder, right. And, or, or your team even, right. So that is actually, is a really good positive that I probably maybe should have mentioned even earlier, uh, of venture capital is this sort of idea that, Hey, you know what, I can afford to get amazing people. I can also be very competitive with who I'm hiring. So there's definitely clearly merits to having more money in the bank, right. However, one of the things that you can get, you can do as a bootstrap founder is very similar. You can uh, commit to, you know, a really strong network, uh, networking effort. You can surround yourself by other uh, experts that are, you know, um, have different skills than you do. Uh, you can um, basically build out that advisory group that you could have bought, you know, with the other you know, you, you can sort of, you get it either, either comes along for the ride or you can, you know, more or less purchase expertise if you've got more money in the bank, but you don't actually need to, if you get creative. And so definitely uh, understand that there's more than one way to um, get the advice you need. And it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have um, it given to you by your um, venture backed partners, or uh, you don't always have to purchase it either. Uh, if you have something really interesting, you can, you, you can, you can oftentimes get people's attention and they're, they're willing to give you that great advice, okay? Um, the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, master marketing, okay? On bottom right here, master marketing. So, and sales, and sales, uh, depending on what kind of company you're building, you know, it might be more sales or, uh focus, maybe it's more, you know, B2B sales. If it's, you know, consumer, uh, direct to consumer, it's probably going to be more marketing, right? Uh, but whatever the case may be, uh, whatever you're building, you need to master marketing and sales. You need to know how to bring money into the company as an organization. Uh, and uh, you want to basically not just get obsessively focused on product and technology, which is what most entrepreneurs are going to focus on if, um, you know, uh, if they're left to their own devices. From my experience, most of us are just going to focus there as an organization because that's the fun stuff I think a lot of us get into this for is that we want to make things, want to build things. Uh, and sales and marketing is sort of like a necessary evil. And, you know, if you're a venture back company, you can sometimes get away with not having to learn it uh, very, very well as an organization early because you can pay to have, you know, uh, agencies to work for you and all sorts of fun stuff. But you, uh, you don't have that luxury oftentimes when you're, 
bootstrapped. Again, I'm just, I'm generalizing, but from my experience, that is the case. And so you want to actually commit to an education or have folks on your team that are experts in these areas, not just folks on your teams that are experts in um, product and operations. Uh, the, fine, uh, the, the last thing here, uh, second last thing actually is basically um, bring on co-founders, but be careful. And I think you could actually say this for regardless of which path you choose, be careful with the co-founders. Um, I, I think it's really important to have partners, but you have to have really good partners. And especially, uh, you know, typically with bootstrap companies, you, you may actually be in the company even longer because you're not chasing like a quick exit. You know, the average sort of exit that I think a venture back company wants to kind of go after is like a five-year exit, right? You know, five, five years is sort of like, the, the benchmark that we, we, we typically chase. Um, and so if I'm bootstrapped, maybe it's, you know, I'm working on this company for 10 years or more, maybe it's indefinite, right? And so you want to really be careful, like, do I love working with the people that I'm working with? And so who, who my partners are uh, is going to be very, very important because it's going to be less of us decision, decision makers typically in a bootstrap company. And so if you have decision makers that you're not aligned to, it's can be even worse because you don't even have, you know, other allies because, you know, you only have two or three people that are uh, the other part of this equation, right? So that's, uh, that's really important. And then um, last one, the, the, the big, uh, big circle in the middle, evaluate every capital investment uh, energy investment and expense in the company. Uh, if you're a bootstrap company, every dollar does matter. Um, if you're spending money one place, it means you're not spending it somewhere else. If you're putting energy one place and focus, it means you're not putting the energy somewhere else. You do not have the luxury that um, you can just sort of sprinkle things around and hope for the best. You really have to be very good at focusing on the things that matter. Um, you know, the sort of the, uh, Pareto's law, the, the 80, 20, you want to focus on the 20% that gives you 8% of the results. Right. Um, and so that you got to be super efficient. You got to know when to, you know, uh, to, uh, triage things if they're not going the right way. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff becomes much more vital as a bootstrap company, uh, than, than if you are, uh, you know, you can pay for a lot of mistakes. You can pay to sort of cover up a lot of mistakes if you're you get enough money in the bank, right? So this is really important. And again, I'm thinking about companies that are starting here. Um, so a lot of this advice is for very early stage, you know, starting out entrepreneurs that are going down this particular path. Uh, once you go further up the path, then, you know, uh, obviously the advice is going to be different, but this is like very early stage advice. Okay. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'm going to just uh, quickly get into some uh, case studies now. Uh, I've, I've, I've selected four case studies here to kind of give you uh, some inspiration, hopefully, as to the types of bootstrap companies you can build. I think that we sometimes think that there's only one type of music here, but uh, there, there's actually quite a few different ways to, to uh, you know, string this company together. Um, and I'll show you uh, a couple of successful examples here that um, you'll probably have heard of and, um, and sort of um, and may not have realized that they were bootstrapped. So first one we'll start with is the disruptor. This is the uh, the uh, one type of company that you can find in the market of bootstrapping. Uh, Zoho Corporation is a great example. Uh, they were direct competitors to, or are direct competitors to Microsoft, Oracle, Sage, SAP, and Salesforce, among other companies that do very similar uh, suite of uh, technology, business technology services. Um, they are an Indian multinational technology company um, and they're competing with some really high pedigree companies. Like if you look at that list, you know, these are not companies to sort of fool with, right? And yet they've been very, very successful uh, over the last 20 years, actually. So they've, you know, they've been around since 1996, which is pretty amazing uh, and still going strong. Um, and they basically, um, have um, done this all bootstrapping it, right? So they, they, they're not venture backed. Uh, the way that they competed is that they decided to come in less expensive, right? So they, gave, they offered a ton of value. They really packed their sort of freemium services uh, into their suites of, of, of products so that people could easily and affordably uh, take advantage of you know, their, their business um, products. And they basically were not able to sort of undercut a lot of their uh, they're, they're more higher pedigree uh, competitors in, in the US and, and, and Europe and so on. Um, they um, last estimation, they're a $140 million valuation company. So not, not too bad. 
Um, okay, so next one is um, Mailchimp. We'll, we'll call this the transition play. This is something that I am, you know, very uh, a big big fan of personally. Um, it's something that I've also sort of um, not not entirely, but in partial partially sort of as a strategy that I'm using in my own businesses. So basically, what they did is they founded a um, an agency back in 2001. Um, uh, the two founders, Ben and Dan. Uh, uh, Carzias and, and Ben uh, Chestnut, and basically their uh, their uh, agency Rocket uh, Science Group uh, was their main business at the time. And then what they did is they had email an email tool that they'd sort of built in house uh, that they were using to get their own com- customers. And some of their customers started asking them, "Hey, well, can you uh, you know <laughs> can you make that for us, right?" And so uh, they basically started Mailchimp as a side hustle after a number of years, about about four, uh, sorry, five or six years in, they started uh, six, almost six years in, they started uh, Mailchimp. Basically, they kept it as a side hustle for a number of years, and then they eventually gave up the web design business because they actually were gaining more traction with the the uh, the software business, and they also um, just enjoyed working on it more. Uh, they had lost some of the passion for the, you know, the original uh, consultancy that they had started. Um, and uh, now that's their main gig, of course. All of us know, or most of us should know, who Mailchimp is. Uh, they're you know the biggest or one of the biggest mail uh, service providers um, uh, for for uh, companies, um, and uh, their last valuation was estimated at uh, 12 billion, right? And again, entirely bootstrapped. So again, you can build a big successful company bootstrapping it. Uh, a, a unicorn, as they say, over, over a billion dollar valuation company. Uh, next one is uh, GitHub. Um, this is the side hustle play. So sorry, I didn't, one thing I should mention here with the transition play. Uh, basically what's kind of interesting is that let's say you want to build a product um, that, um, and this is some advice for us who are trying to build something that's really expensive maybe to build. Maybe you want to build this like really cool, you know, technology, like, a, you know, example might be a game. You want to build a, actually we'll get to games in a minute, but let's just say it's a, a game or, a, or a, a, type, a hard tech software sort of, project that you're building or even like a um hardware it, it's like it's actual not hard tech but it's actually hardware it's actually like a physical product that you're trying to build that's going to be very very expensive you know um like you know i don't know the, the next uh, competitor to tesla or something right so you're building this sort of you have this vision and you're like well the only way i could possibly do this is to basically you know um raise money because there's nobody there's no way i could ever afford to sort of work on this otherwise well what you could do is something similar to this transition play where you could actually start a one type of company that's giving you the cash flow. And during basically some of the, the, the time that you're working on that, you can start to invest more and more energy into the ultimate product that you're trying to build and then transition into that ultimate product. There's lots of ex- other examples like that um, in the market of companies that started one way and then they sort of you know, pivoted into this other, this or transition all their energy into this other version of the product, right? Um, that became much more successful. So that is a, a strategy that you can employ. A lot of times this is done by accident, but there's no reason you can actually intentionally do that if you think that, hey, I could actually start something here that's maybe, for example, an agency that's consulting with the customer that I'm going to ultimately serve this like really cool end product to. Uh, that I'm going to build out, but I'm going to learn all about the industry by basically doing consulting for them. And that's going to be my first business, but then I'm going to take, because it's very inexpensive to start a consulting company. And then I'm going to take the resources and invest into building the actual like technology product as an example. Right. And so that's a very common thing that you'll see um, uh, a lot of people do and some by accident, but you can actually do it as a strategy. So that's why we call it the transition play. Uh, the side hustle, getting into GitHub. Okay, so GitHub. I think most of us that are in, you know, software development will know who these guys are, of course. But basically, uh, they are, uh, you know, a uh, a company that uh, supports um, uh, using using Git, basically using a repository to you know serve your code and and collaborate with other software developers, um, and you know and 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 house your um, basically your your um, instructions, your all all your uh, uh, your code, and so this is basically um, you know the most popular uh, company that does this. Uh, this company um, was founded uh, with the intention to to be um, 
a bootstrap company. It was actually originally started as a side hustle. So the, fa the founders basically had full-time developers jobs before um, they ever, you know, joined GitHub full-time. Um, and that's also a common narrative that you'll see a lot of times, you know, with a, the cool thing with the bootstrap company is that you don't have to uh, quit your day job um, because there's nobody to answer to. Um, if you are raising money, typically you're going to have to quit your day job. So um, if you, you know, like doing something, but you want to also experiment with entrepreneurship, it may be a better option for you to think about bootstrapping. Um, basically uh, with GitHub, the founders um, set a monthly sort of monetary goal for the company. Uh, they're very like, you know, strategic about how they were going to build this out and how they were going to sort of have it um, either, you know, stay a side hustle or become, you know, their main gig. Um, and then um, they gave themselves modest salaries and then over time it became, you know, something that they really, you know, focused energy on. Eventually it was acquired in 2018 by uh, Microsoft for uh, seven and a half billion dollars. So again, very successful um, bootstrap company, very intentional how they built it. And they um, uh, sort of started it out um, as something that, you know, became, uh, uh, a very, very successful, you know, quote unquote unicorn after, uh, after many, uh, uh, many years. Last uh, example, um, that I'll give you, um, is Mohan. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. I apologize if I'm not, uh, Mohan studios. Um, they're basically responsible for Minecraft. So I'm going to, we're going to call this the indie play. So the indie play is basically where you kind of, you're not, you know, trying to trying to kind of play the bigger kind of uh, incumbents game. You're just going to go and do your own thing, right? And so they they built a very very successful, you know, game Minecraft um, that uh, uh, obviously uh, everybody on, on the planet Earth has probably heard of. And they um, they did it um, by not trying to compete with like the best graphics in the world and you know the, the 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 most sophisticated you know sort of studio a uh you know uh a type of product um they built like something that was just completely different that that, that, that they believed in that was very interesting to them and that's a, that's a very common theme that you'll see in the bootstrap world as well which i actually love is that you know oftentimes you don't have to play the game the way everybody else is telling you to play it so you know if if i'm a venture backed game studio, I'm, you know, automatically now competing with every other, you know, venture back game studio that has like sort of, you know, so you're playing a certain type of rules. That means that the, the kind of games you're building are probably typically direct competitive competitors to those other games because you're all chasing that sort of same, you know, sort of event. Whereas here you can kind of do your own thing and just basically say, Hey, you know, I'm, we're going to build some stuff that we love, you know, and, you know, sometimes you get lucky and, uh, you get just the same type of success. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't be independent and uh, bootstrapped and try to compete with the, you know, the blizzards of the world or the other sort of major game studios of the world, but it doesn't mean you have to, you have the option that's a little bit easier to do when you're bootstrapping it. So this is a great uh, success story, obviously. Um, and they uh, only after four years, they were able to be acquired by Microsoft for two and a half billion dollars. So not a bad uh, four year uh, outcome uh, to say the least, right? So these are some great examples of different paths that you can take as a bootstrap company and still gain success, right? Um, so in summary, choose your own adventure um, and choose it wisely. Okay. So just be informed. I think the moral of this story, if you remember anything is just remember this slide that, you know, that you can basically, you have options. Um, you, you might, you might've been taught that there's only one way, but I'm here to tell you that there's more than one way I've, I've done, you know, uh, both op options. Um, I've been also seduced by option one and thinking things were going to be super awesome when I raised that first round and, you know, and not to say that I wouldn't have done it. Cause I actually think it's an amazing experience that, you know, uh, regardless of whether you, you know, want to choose between one of these paths or, or, or other, I think any path you choose is going to be an amazing experience and journey, especially if you treat it like that. If you think of this as like a lifelong journey and that you're, you know, learning, from every decision you make. Um, but just understand that, you know what, if you make a very calculated and wise decision, a well-informed decision from day one, you're gonna actually have an amazing, um, a much more amazing experience, hopefully, because regardless of the outcome, you're gonna get exactly what you expected. Okay, so that's, uh, that's um, 
one thing in summary. The other thing is I'm going to hammer home the advantages I see in bootstrapping it. Um, a lot of people would argue that there's you know, all the disadvantages of bootstrapping it because it doesn't have all the sort of virtues of getting, you know, a bolt on advisory group and, you know, uh, flush with cash in the bank, you know, from day one, all this stuff. But I'm going to show you that these are the uh, advantages that you do get. Um, so you get basically, uh, you don't have to dilute your uh, ownership. I think that's the one everybody talks about. I actually think it's the least important one, um, even though it's the one that's most commonly used for bootstrapping or the decision to bootstrap. It's like, oh, well, you know what? I don't have to give up equity. The the, the truth is, is that, you know, um, there's sort of the saying that I'd rather have a smaller piece of a billion dollar pie than a bigger piece of a, you know, a hundred percent of a, you know, million dollar pie, right? Um, which makes sense, right? Because you're, you're, you're making more money. Um, but um, the other thing here is that, um, you know, there's lots of ways that you can dilute ownership that have nothing to do with venture capital. So, you know, there's cooperative companies, there's companies that are owned by their staff, there's companies that have multiple co-founders, there's companies that have one co-founder, there's companies that have, um, you know, uh, uh, give, give money to advisors, give money to other folks, right? So you, you, can, you can basically, so diluting of ownership is really not, I think, something to be so obsessed with. I think you do definitely want to understand like where your ownership is going in the company, where the equity is going in it. But I don't think that that is really a good reason or like the best reason to consider bootstrapping. I think that um, in either case, you know, you can have like a very, you know, non-diluted company uh, or a very diluted company. Um, even with venture capital companies, there's companies that, uh, you know, uh, the founders get, you know, based on their pedigree or based on circumstances of negotiation, they get a lot more equity than uh, and better terms than other founders. They get really, you know, unfortunate terms. Uh, so um, I think that that's a whole thing to maybe spend less emphasis on and really think about the kind of people that you want in your company that have ownership. I think that's more important. It's like, who are the people that I want in my company that have ownership, regardless whether they got ownership because they gave money or they got ownership because they're actually operating with sweat equity or whatever they're doing, right? Um, the, the next five ideas are, I think, more interesting. So um, you basically are going to get full control of the direction of the business. So what I mean by that is that we talked about, you know, whatever your values are. Well, typically the values of a company are, you know, um, oftentimes the values of the founders, right? And so if you have certain values that are maybe not as common or not as attractive to investment, you can still maintain those values and build a very, very successful company because those values um, are what you care about. It doesn't mean that it incentivizes more wealth uh, or more like, you know, uh, uh, more profit, but it actually has a whole bunch of other virtues that you believe in. And so that's the really cool thing is that you can maintain full control over those virtues and those ideas. Um, you also can control your lifestyle a little bit more, I, I, I believe. And that's my own experience. Again, I'm biased here. This whole presentation is probably a little biased, but um, again, I, I want to give you you know, I'm trying to be, um, you know, more or less balanced with, you know, giving you the both sides of it. Um, you have full control of your lifestyle, meaning, you know, if you want to have, you know, uh, if you want to travel all the time, um, well, there's no pressure that you have to be, you know, near, near your venture capital, you know, home base or whatever, right? You don't, you don't have the same pressure um, with, you know, the, like the speed that you're going to grow the company, which might keep you up at night, you can, you know, you're still probably gonna be working really hard and you're probably still going to work the same number of hours as your counterparts that have the venture back firm. But I think there's just a bit of a different energy and there's this sort of a sense of more control over your lifestyle because ultimately you just have less people that, um, are going to pressure you one way or the other. Um, it also gives you the ability to learn every aspect of the business. Again, you can't purchase your way out of all your problems early on. So you're going to actually be probably a little bit more resilient to all the different things that you need to do as a founder to be successful in the early stage. And so that actually is a force function of success. Oftentimes it's kind of like the stoic mentality of like, you know, the obstacle is the way as uh, Ryan holiday would, uh, uh famous author would, would say, you know, the obstacle is the way, right? So you're, you, you know, you're giving yourself a bit of a disadvantage with the capital, but the advantage is that you're building more resilience and a better skill set potentially, right? Um, 
the the lack of external funding um, also makes you you know uh, get really creative and innovate in ways that would be um, you know would and the whole company kind of takes advantage of that uh, in ways that you probably wouldn't need to even think about if you've got the capital in the bank so you can oftentimes sort of just use the use the playbook the you know the venture capital sort of playbook uh is is pretty specific in terms of like where you spend money how you spend money you know what you're doing whereas here you can be very creative and it can lead to some really interesting outcomes um and then you can basically obviously become you know, much more capital efficient all the way through the life cycle of the business. It's probably a really healthy habit that you can build into, um, you know, the entire, you know, sort of culture of the company. Um, it also could create maybe a much more sustainable sort of outcome for um, the environment around you, whether it's the, uh, you know, the, the the community that you're building the company in or the people that are working with the company and all that stuff. So those are some advantages uh, to bootstrapping. Last part is some recommended learning. If you want to learn more about bootstrapping, I, I think this is a great book um, to, to start with. Uh, the founder of Moz, who um, left his company, Moz, um, uh, not on a high note, not on a good note. He was not very happy with the experience, but he learned a ton from it. And he shared his experience really, really candidly and honestly in, um, in his book called Lost and Founder. And so uh, he also shares his advice um, and goes a lot deeper than I have had an opportunity to go in this presentation on sort of the pitfalls of the classic sort of startup venture capital world that he was part of uh, with his company. So that's a great book to read if you want to sort of just get, um, you know, another perspective, another person's sort of perspective on this kind of world and why, and why he, he ultimately chose to go um, bootstrap on his next business. Um, and then if you want to uh, still go down the path um, of venture capital, um, I'm a big fan of uh, this book by Peter Thiel. Uh, he, uh, you know, uh, is a very famous investor. Uh, obviously, he, he uh, if you watch the social network, he saw that he was the first investor in, uh, in, in Facebook and uh, many other very successful companies. Um, I... Uh, was fortunate enough to, uh, to, to actually get him to sign uh, a copy of his book when it first came out, because I happened to be in San Francisco at the time. And uh, it was really cool. He's doing a book reading there. And so I think that's probably is I, I'm very biased because I, I met him and, you know, I thought that the, uh, the book was awesome and I got, I got a signed copy of it, but uh, it is a, it is a fantastic book um, around the idea of um, building a company that actually deserves venture capital. Okay. So if you want to raise money, that's great. Um, but build a company that actually has enough significance to be undeniable to venture capital in, the, in from day one. And I think that he gives probably some of the best advice I've seen in terms of trying to do that from day one. And there are certain types of companies that honestly, you, you may need to get venture capital involved right away. You know, if you're doing biotech or you're doing, you know, some hard tech stuff or some like, you know, things that are physical types of projects that, you know, we have phys a lot of physical uh, material like atoms versus, you know, pixels, uh, you may actually need um, some money that beyond what you can get from any of the ways that I mentioned as a bootstrapper. And so if that's the case, then again, just choose wisely and, and, and learn everything you can about doing that at the highest level. Um, last thing I'll leave you with is I I'm doing another presentation. I, I was invited uh, to do uh, another presentation with um, One Business World. So I really want to thank them for this opportunity once again. And um, I'm going to be doing my next live presentation uh, or my next presentation uh, live on November 4th, uh, 2021 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it will be uh, uploaded thereafter uh, in uh, hopefully in the, the, the database at uh, One Business World. So uh, I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, this presentation is going to be about, uh, it's sort of a part two to this in some ways, but it is actually completely different that you don't need to have even seen this to, I think, uh, you know, get some benefit from the other one, but it's basically about uh, building uh, certain types of businesses. So building businesses uh, that are uh, focused on impact, um, it's all about the quadruple bottom line. It's about building purposeful people-driven brands, uh, for a better world. And so, uh, I look forward to, um, presenting that and hopefully, uh, having, uh, somebody, uh, here that, uh, would enjoy it as well. So, um, please join us.
And um, last thing here, um, just a quick hi, uh, if you wanted to uh, reach out to me, here's the two places that you can actually find me, uh, probably easiest right now. Uh, one is uh, just emailing me at uh, emery at uh, spaceage.agency, uh, and we can do a quick hi or uh, maybe even a Zoom coffee if, if we want to set something up together. And then the other way is uh, just to uh, connect with me on Twitter at uh, Emery Bishop. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.